Great, um, good morning from a, a very chilly Karoo. <laughs> um, you know, winter is really upon us here. And uh, yeah, my name is Ryan Tippett. And um, yeah, I am a field guide by training. I've been my whole working career uh, a field guide um, 20 years now. And uh, since about 2010, I've also been um, involved in, in guide um, training as a guide training instructor. And um, yeah, still actively involved in both where I can. And um, currently been doing a lot of work with um, LES and the BDI and so on with citizen science. So it's been uh, something I've really, really enjoyed. So yeah, without further ado, <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about Odonata map and the Dragonfly Atlas that we've been working on. So let's um, just have a look here. Okay, so just quickly um, a, a bit of an outline of what I'm going to discuss. It's nothing major, but I'm going to be going through an introduction to Odonata map itself. Um, I'll, then I'll give you a quick walkthrough on Odonata map and just what it's so people who haven't been there can actually have a look and see what it looks like and then we'll talk about the dragonfly atlas and again um, a bit of a walkthrough on some of the pages on that so Odonata map was a project started on the 22nd of September in 2010 so it's into its 11th year now. And um, the virtual museum, well, it's part of the virtual museum. And the Odonata map itself is one of 18 sort of basic, roughly taxon specific projects. Yeah. So the aims of Odonata, Odonata map have been to map the current distribution of dragonflies and damselflies throughout Africa and to serve as a repository for all existing distribution data for this order in Africa. Um, so yeah, so, and for another aim is to really to raise awareness and interest in dragonflies and damselflies. And uh, that's been quite successful, I think, for sure. There's been um, huge growth in, in the interest in dragonflies in terms of flies over the last um, number of years. So you'll see some of the, the facts I've got just now. So the database, first of all, for Odonata map, currently consists of, as of this morning, there's 110,050 records, which um, these are photographic records submitted by citizen scientists, uh, which is a, I think quite an impressive number of, of records and the vast majority of them have been identified to species and used in the data. In addition to this, the, sub, the citizen science records, we have 121,000 specimen records, which we call the ADDO database, um, which consists of museum records and the personal records of Dr. Klaus Dijkstra, who is the world authority on dragonflies. So, so combined, we're looking at a really a, a huge database. Of the ADDO records, about 20,000 relate to South Africa alone. So yeah, around about 100,000 for the rest of Africa. And um, yeah, the, I think, I haven't got it on the, on the slide there, but we have about 543 observers on the Odonata map, registered to the Odonata map project. So 543 observers, and at least 28 of these observers have contributed over 1,000 records each, um, some of them several thousand. And there's a further four odd people who have got around 900 and something records submitted. So. Is that there's a, a handful of really committed observers, and we have also got more casual observers who don't send in as many records. Admittedly, there's probably around 50 odd people who've sent in only one or two records. 
to the projects, but um, they all count. And um, really one of the other things that we would aim to do is to try to increase the amount of contributors to these projects. So the growth of the project, this has been quite interesting because we have, there you can see on the, on the, the table, started in 2010 where only 201 records were submitted to the to the database and it continued to grow every year um, it's really started to snowball and, and gain momentum around 2013 onwards and every year has seen a lot of growth up until we get to there the highlighted year 2018 where over 21,000 records were, were contributed um, there has been a drop off in the last couple of years, but that is quite likely um, a, 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 um, down to the drought, I guess. Um, we've definitely noticed a, a slight drop off. It's not a huge drop, but um, yeah. So I think that's a really um, shows consistent growth every year. And um, we, we not only are people contributing more records, but there are also more people, individual people contributing records to the project. Um, yeah. So the Dragonfly Atlas itself. Um, okay. Before I go to the Dragonfly Atlas, I'd like to just see if I can. Um, sorry, just bear with me here, please. I haven't. Um, <laughs> I think I need to try and minimize this. And I just want to show you a couple of um, screenshots of. Okay. Sorry, I should have in hindsight put these on as screenshots rather than going back to the internet. I, I hope this is showing. Um, can anyone tell me if you can see this? Ryan, we're still seeing your PowerPoint. Um, did you choose share your the whole screen? Um, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently, I just want people to view the, the, the internet, the site for virtual museum. I'm not sure how okay, to no, do that. Not. Have I clicked on something wrong? I think when you share your, when you choose to share your screen, you have the option of sharing your whole computer or just a specific screen. Perhaps just unshare and then reshare to see if it helps. Okay. Um, if we share the yeah. screen, then you can tell toggle thing. between the different. Um, this one here. How's that? Yeah, we've got it. Perfect. Now you should be able to okay. go from one to the other. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, it's the first time I've tried to to do a Zoom presentation by switching between. <laughs> So yeah, here's the, the homepage of the virtual museum with the Odin Artemap project here. And um, yeah, it's got, there's a lot of different functions and uses on the site where you can either, um, if I just log in here quickly, where you can have a look at your own records, for example, you can, you can go through and um, everything's nicely stored for you you can actually click on the locus here where you can you it'll take you to the quarter degree square where where the record was seen you can actually access other people's records too you can go to observers list here on the left and um yeah there's a full rundown of all the contributors you can see um yeah their records too and locate where records are from and so on so there's quite a lot of interesting things that you can um, do on here. Too many things for me to talk about in such a, a short time. But um, another example is maps. You can always also access maps. Let's have a look here. If I look up the Black Emperor, for example, and you can choose between the maps of South Africa or even Africa, if you so wish. But I'm just going to go to the the basic South African map, and um, it should, yeah, it will, be, and you've got your maps and so on. So there's a lot of 
interesting uses for for yeah researchers right through to just any a layman any enthusiast that that may want to to find any information or it, also these maps help to to help other people if you are say for example looking for particular species to add to your photographic collection or to add to your records that you submit you can um, I, I use it a lot to to find out where other species and whatnot may occur where you could um, try and look for some records um, it's nicely done in a way where you can't really for for perhaps rare and really scarce species some of them are could, could be hidden for example some of the reptiles where the some are very sensitive species where um, the general public can't really access the specifics of where that creature was found but um, in, in less protected species or species of least concern um, you can get quite a good idea of where the the records were so you can you can play around with it there's just a lot uh, really a lot you can do and, and um, it's quite interesting to to go through the the records and and so on but yeah this really just the the date where the database is all stored and um and so on so yeah i'm going to sorry just stop share again so i can um show my powerpoint and um Okay, um, so we're back on to the, I just want to now move on to the Dragonfly Atlas, which will be um, really the main bit of what I want to, to talk about. This is one of the, the projects I'm actively involved in. And uh, to give it its full title, um, from I got from Les, this is the Atlas and Phenology of the Odonata of South Africa, Lesotho and Swatini, which is obviously formerly Swaziland. And um, the Dragonfly Atlas gets all the its data information from Odonata map. Um, this atlas was started in 2019. And um, the aims of this atlas are to provide a free, intuitive, and user-friendly resource um, that is useful to both researchers and the layman or enthusiast. So there's a lot of we're fortunate in South Africa at the moment, there's a, a lot of resources available on Odonata. We have a couple of great field guide books out, um, Warwick Tarbiton, there's a, um, from Professor Samways, I think, Michael Samways, there's a, a PDF of his book that um, is, is freely available. And um, he's also got a couple of books. There's, there's a number of online, resources such as identification websites and so on so so we're quite spoiled for for the amount of information we have so really the more the more the merrier um, but in our instance with the dragonfly atlas the, the the focus is less on identification there's a lot of identification resources out there so our primary focus is in the distribution and phenology and um, the secondary focus is then on behavior, habitat, and conservation status. So I'll show you just now, and I'll do a quick run through of the of a couple of pages on the atlas, um, where you'll see we we trying to really just make it a an informative database with information and um, as much information as we can gather. To put on but as i say the primary focus is the distribution and phenology and additionally we want to increase the awareness of dragonflies and damselflies these pages of the atlas are freely available and um, they're easily accessible through google you just google a species or whatnot you can pick up the the info on them you can from the common name um, or Latin name or whatnot, and you can also access the Atlas through the BDI website. Um, okay, wait, <laughs> skip the slide. Um, 
apologies again. I just need to stop share and then I will go on to the um, Okay, sorry, I'm back again. Um, apologies for that once more. So here's a page from the, the BDI Atlas. We've got the, the, the Odonata Atlas. So I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of each, you know, a, a page or two and um, what, what it features. So just something quite simple. But so I've started here with the Southern Finger Tail, one of the, the interesting dragonfly species we have. And uh, as you can see, it, uh, we've kept it quite um, visual also. So it's, it's nice and attractive to, the, the sub page is attractive to look at. We have a number of links throughout the page, which will connect you to various things. So um, this first link, link here, Gomfridia Quare, will take you to the Edo site, which is um, where the, the actual, the whole database of, dragonflies and damselflies of Africa is. And you can see it'll, it'll link you to the, the page on that particular species where you can get further information and um, links to, to all the other African species, as well as then, yeah, maps. This map comes from the, this is the Africa map from, for the species from the virtual museum, the Odonata map. And um, yeah, all the other, these are some of the museum records and so on. And then you can, there's also links to each photograph that we have is linked to, to for example, if I click on here, that will take, that will take you to the, the actual record of this photograph above in the, 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 the Odonata map project. And so, as I said to you just now, the, the focus is not so much on identification. We, we do feature some ID features and, um, and so on with, in terms of, of each species, some male and female information that I've created with the with slides. Each, each um, record is again linked to, to the, the virtual museum record for people who are interested to go and see that. And then I've also got below the, the text for info identification, we've got another link which clicks, which will link to, to here, which is um, the site built by John Wilkinson and Rob Dickinson. Uh, John Wilkinson is also, along with myself and a couple others, on the expert ID panel for, for dragonflies and damselflies on Odonata map. And John has created his own identification website, a visual ID site. So, so this site's also linked through every, every species page on the Atlas. So that's quite a, a handy sort of, center where you can, the, the, the atlas is a handy center where you can then access and link other um, information regarding the species you're looking for. We've got uh, information on the habitat. We've tried to give it sort of, the information on many species is fairly limited beyond identification. So the whole aim is really to, to build up a database of info now on habitats. And I've tried to where possible add photographs of, of, of suitable habitats, a typical habitat for species. Um, there are some species in the, in the atlas where we haven't yet got habitat images. Um, there's also, just to go back, there's also species where we haven't got, for example, female photographs that with ID slides. Um, but those sort of things we can add in time and we, we do, I, I update and add things as I get them constantly. So, 
and again there's just some behavior information and then um, we have info on status and, and conservation distribution and then these are the maps that les created to to these all this data has come from odonata map and um les tries has tried to to add some interesting and different maps here with a lot of info that creates so so here we have these um sort of imputed maps which which actually become more accurate with more data so species that have really a lot of data from the the odonata map project these imputed maps are substantially better than on species where the information is is lacking and or the data is lacking so these imputed maps as i say become much more accurate and you can see here the reliability of imputing for for the species the southern fingertail um, is quite quite good and then we get down to the phenology which shows you graphs of the seasonal occurrences of each particular species and we've got um so these are all nice and detailed and informative to help anybody who's trying to research or even just look for these species they can get a good solid um, bit of information so we've really tried to to create a page where for each species where you've got it's the go-to place we want it to be where you can get all the info you need um, for each species uh, over and above what you get in the in the field guide books and so on which are often quite um, um, thin on, on on information regarding phenology habitat and, and so on they'll often just um, give you the basics there and uh, again the, the main focus on those sort of pages is or books and, and so on is on identification yeah um and then i'm just going to show you a where's the other one um yeah okay so this is the last thing i forgot to mention is that in the id we've also linked to to other species. So here the most similar species to, to this southern fingertail will be the Ictinogompus ferox, the southern, sorry, the common tiger tail. And um, if you click on that link, you will get to, to that species specific page. So you can jump between pages and um, compare species, quite similar species with ease. Um, so yes, that's really the a rundown of um, the atlas and uh, as i say it's a work in progress we've every every species is on and and available the information is available but on a daily or weekly basis or whenever i get extra info and time i add and and um, we add and uh, increase the information available on the atlas so yeah Yeah, I think that's 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 about it that I for what I have to tell you today. So yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, wow, that's. Yeah. I've, I've thank been... you. I'm sorry, it's a little bit um, disjunct there. I um I hadn't planned on. <laughs> I didn't realize it would be such a um, distraction to swap between uh, i've never tried to do that before no, so, no yeah. problem I think I things. we've got to see it all it's fantastic i was i've been lucky to have a, a sneak preview of all the you know the the bdi the, the sheets of all the species because obviously we've linked it to fbis so um wonderful okay so would do people need like a five minute stretch Make a cup of tea break, or are we happy to sort of wander through to some questions? Because I'm sure there's going to be quite a bit of discussion. Shall we? Shall we just move ahead? I think that'll be fine. So let's open it up.
Firstly, thank you so much, Karis and Liz and Ryan. Fantastic presentations. It really gives us such a wonderful overview of citizen science. Um, anyone want to kick off the, the questions? Just hit the put up your hand and we'll go through. Astrid, you're free. Thanks. Thanks a lot for these uh, very inspiring talks. Really, I very much appreciate what you told us uh, today. Um, but as much as I like the idea that citizen science projects might change the minds uh, of people to a more ecologically grounded worldview, uh, as a scientist, we still have to look that we get data that are useful for us. And I am, as you can maybe see in the back, I'm working on smaller insects than dragonflies. And um, I find it very hard to, um, yeah, to think of what citizen science this can contribute in terms of uh, mayflies, uh, stoneflies, or caddisflies, because they are much uh, smaller, mm -hmm. and they are there is not they are not so well seen uh, as adults. You can only or you will mostly um, collect them as in as, as larvae. Yeah. And this brings me automatically to the question about the quality control. So about quality controlling the data that are um, brought in. Uh, I think for the Odonata map, uh, I have seen there is a status accepted. So I think someone then um, says this species is okay. So my question would be, how is the quality control in, 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 in your um, projects? Um, because I think mostly it would need an expert and how is this expert then paid? It's mm -hmm. always a, 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 a matter of um, funds for those experts, I think. And I would also be interested whether you also already use automatic uh, image recognition for um, um, quality controlling the photos that are uploaded. Great. I'll, I'll have it. A lot of a stab at answering, okay. uh, answering that. So the, um, um, the, the um, amazingly, amazingly, there are, um, there are, there's another team of citizen scientists who, um, whose contribution to the project, or one of their contributions to the project, is actually doing the identifications and um, and, and, and amazingly, there are, there are people who actually enjoy doing that. And Ryan is one of, one of the, um, the people. So there's about six or eight um, members of the expert panel for Odonata Map. And um, the system is set up that, um, that before an identification is confirmed, two people have to agree on the um, identification. In the in the bird uh, one, bird virtual museum, we just have it set up for one person to, uh, to to do the identification. So you do you have to identify an avocet. You don't need a second person to check up on your identification. So um, um, the, the, um, the, the 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 quality control from that perspective is, I think, pretty good. And um, so it's identification by, uh, by experts, uh, not identification by democracy. So the, the observer puts what he or she thinks is the, um, is, the, is the species, and that helps, usually helps <laughs> enormously. Occasionally with dragonflies, I get it so wrong that I must actually uh, confuse the expert panel. And they've got to uh, tell the bloke in charge that he's got it wrong. So they do quite happily. And, um, and and they're under no pressure to identify to species. So um, an and, and awful lot of the, um, the drop wings that I submit just get identified to genus. And uh, they can't do the identification to species, they don't do it. So, um, so it's, it's, it's actually quite, quite, a, um, quite a tight and a robust system. Um, the bloke who does the uh, the butterflies is amazing because he has a, um, a mental picture of the map of the distribution of 800 species of butterflies in his head. And if a, 
And if a record is out of range, he actually spots it. And I just think that's an incredible talent. So he, he, he reports this, their range extensions very quickly. And, um, and so, so there's a, a really, really amazing team of people who actually do the identifications. And amazingly, they, they do it as, um, as, as part of their citizen scientist um, hobby. Okay, so um, so we are we are very keen to um, to tie up with um, the the there's a, a Dutch Belgian project called observations.org and they do um, um, image recognition mm -hmm. um, and 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 we're um, we, we, we're talking very seriously with them about uh, uh, col collaboration and that's one of the things that we would love to uh, collaborate on is is, is, is getting you know, getting the the IDs done by automatically where possible, that could help. But um, so that means it's basically also here mainly voluntary work, which is fine as long as you have experts uh, uh, in this uh, on this level. Um, and the other question is, do you did you try any other group living in fresh waters uh, that is not fish and not amphibians and not odonata? um no no we haven't so um so i I, th I think there are there are limitations to what is citizen scienceable and i think um i think uh, I, I think there are lots of things which are um, which would be extremely difficult to get large volumes of data mm -hmm. from but uh, but there are there are always people who uh who do just take on these these challenges and uh and, and gosh, we've been amazed at, um, at the response, say, to uh, for some of the projects that Lens people will go to. Uh, I think, Ryan, you've got ideas on, uh, on, on projects for some of these more difficult species, or groups of species. Yes, I've, I've had a few ideas, but um, the, the big problem comes down to identifiability of mm. the, the taxa. Dragonflies, for example, is relatively a simple group to because there's there's a lot of resources out there on identification. South Africa has around 164 species in total, so so it's not an overwhelming number. And the adult form of almost all of them are pretty easy to identify if you know what you're looking for and you've learned, you know, the steps and and so uh, similar to, to birds in in many ways. Whereas as I can obviously to tell with um, mayflies, other things like dung beetles, it, it gets a lot more tricky where there's there's really a limited amount of people who know what to look for. And and, and just by the, the very nature of those creatures, they are harder to identify. Mm. So yeah, it's not maybe suitable for every mm. kind of taxon, but um, the, the obvious um, and distinctive and colorful groups, I think, um, these projects, I think, can work very well. <laughs> yes, one of the one of the other things that is absolutely essential for running one of these projects is actually is to have a, um, a, f a fairly well established um, taxonomy, mm. and, uh, and 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 a taxon that's got a lot of species which are just just can't be identified. So uh, so so we have a um, a, a, a lacewing map project, and. Um, um, the, the identifications are all done by uh, Mervyn Mansell, who spent his life uh, working with, with um, damsel uh, um, lacewings. And the rate at which lacewing map is uh, collecting data far exceeds what the, um, the um, museum people were doing at the height of museum collection. And, um, and the lacewings, I think, are, are, are tolerably well known. But every now and again, Mervyn says, this, this is a species which must be new to science. So uh, that's, that's quite, quite fun, quite fascinating. And quite difficult, I think, as, uh, as well, challenging. And I think many other groups will be, uh, will be like that too. So you have to choose your, your, your group that you're going to uh, focus on, I think, or whatever you're going to focus on. You have to choose it quite carefully that you can know what you you can look at looking at it and that mm. you can identify it um, you know, from 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 a photo from mm. the virtual museum perspective but from 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 your experience 
uh, this boils down to uh, mayflies, stoneflies, dragonflies are just not suitable for citizen science projects. Ryan, you'd have to answer well, that. Can I leap in here at this stage? Yep. So, yeah. so with, with, I mean, as said, I'm not sure, I'm sure you're aware of like the citizen science mini SAS, you know, where it's yeah. with, for aquatic invertebrates, you know, we have to have it at a much coarser level in terms of taxonomy. So it's order. So you could say, you could teach a citizen scientist how to identify a stonefly versus a mayfly versus a dragonfly. But yeah, I mean, certainly in South Africa, we haven't got to the point where we can do it at, at any greater resolution. Yeah, but this, that doesn't help biodiversity research. I mean, if we uh -huh. just know the order. But if we have them at order already, then maybe we uh, can attract the interest for the go a little bit deeper. But then uh, taxonomy needs to be clarified for LAVI. And this is, um, I think, uh, a huge problem with our groups. Mm. Yeah, for the for the moths, um, which is which is a um, group that it's, the taxonomy is very unsettled. The um, if the um, if the IDs are just done to um, done to, to family, then um, um, then the, the ultimately family specialists can actually go through those uh, those those records so it's quite easy just to pick out some family of moths and actually go through them again and um, and, and do the identifications then as far as uh, as far as possible so it's, it's, it needn't be just a, a one pass system you could actually do it as a as a two phase thing so you get all the moths of one family you know sorted out and then those can go to the um, to the family specialist. So there are strategies yeah. like that, which we um, which we can use. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, any other questions? If not, I would have another one for the Odonator map or uh, for the Dragonfly Atlas. Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, Les, uh, no, uh, Ryan, you showed the, the maps um, where you said they were generated from the Odonator map, so the, the maps in the atlas. Uh, and I was wondering, are they generated on the fly or do it, does it need any update uh, process between Odonator map and the atlas maps? Yeah, I think well, it's... Les to argue <laughs> that he makes the maps. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... so um, so, so my background is actually um, statistics rather than biodiversity. I, I'm a, I'm a total, uh, total fraud um, in the, uh, that I, my PhD is, is abstract uh, multivariate analysis, no biological input as well. So all I know about biology is what my um, colleagues and my students have, have taught me over the years. So, um, um, the um, so so Ryan was making maps from the virtual museum, and those maps were being made on the fly, and uh, and 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 the, and the data being sent to a pretty remote spot in the in the Karoo, and uh, and then coming back to us on the, on um, Zoom. So it was actually amazing how fast the uh, the, the maps are made on the. Um, um, virtual museum website uh, extracting the data from the database. So if you, you upload a, um, a, a record and it gets identified, then it's immediately it becomes part of the, uh, the virtual museum maps. And then it becomes automatically part of the Atlas maps. No, no. So, so then it becomes part of the, um, of, of the, the database and you can produce um, maps of it. But the, um, but the, the those, um, Maps which we call in the the imputed maps, those those would have to be made at um, at at, um, at at intervals and and re-uploaded. So I'm making those maps in um, in Genstat at the moment, and um, and, and Genstat is, is not very good at producing maps. So the maps consist of little circles, which is really mm. you know they're, they're diagrams rather than uh, rather than maps. So the next phase will actually 
the next generation of maps will, um, will include um, a process that actually produces uh, proper, proper grid maps. And we've done that and we've proved it. And as soon as we get to the middle of the year, so we have the, the middle of the winter, we'll do a download, we upload the maps. But the maps don't change very much from, mm. uh, from iteration to, uh, to iteration. And those maps are, are, are produced by a um, interpolation pro process. So there's two ways of basically doing maps. Is you can either do um, um, a niche modeling type approach, which is what things like uh, MaxEnt do, or you can uh, use um, the um, an interpolation uh, approach. So it, it just um, it just does its best to uh, to fill in the um, in the gaps in distribution. And if the data is fairly complete, then um, then the um, the, the imputing, the interpolation process is, uh, is, is, is pretty good. So the, the, that process uses the information on, um, on places where lots of data has been collected and the species is absent. And it actually uses that information, whereas the max n type approaches just use the presence data mm. where, mm. Uh, where species has, uh, has occurred. So um, that's actually, it's my ambition to, um, actually merge the, uh, the the two methods and use the, the imputing approach as a kind of a, a prior distribution for going into something like Maxent and then it comes out with a posterior distribution which is adjusted for the, uh, the, the, the environmental variables. Okay, thanks for clarification. All right, thanks Jim. I see your hand is raised. Jeremy, you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi Les, and yeah, thanks everyone for all three for really, really interesting talks. Um, I didn't even go and make a cup of tea once. Really, really, <laughs> really cool. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a couple of questions. I think um, the first one is, I mean, so you, I know that you and your team have been involved in citizen science since before it became citizen science, which is probably quite a long time ago. And um, obviously the, the, plat the, the platform that's widely used at the moment is iNaturalist. So my question is how much overlap is there between the, what the two platforms do and how do you uh, manage that? And how do the two platforms uh, interoperate? I think I think the answer to that is is is, um, is at the moment there's um, there's there's no um, interoperability. I think those are, are political questions rather than practical questions. And I would dearly love to see um, you know sort of some uh, overlap. And I know Ryan would like that as well because there are um, very valuable distribution records in our naturalist which are. Are not getting into the imputed, imputing process for the for the maps, so that's something I'd I'd like to uh, I'd like to to solve. But it's just at the moment it, it doesn't seem to be a an, an easy an easy uh, political hurdle to get over. Okay, and then thanks, Les. And then my next question is: um, I was actually chatting to a colleague about this yesterday, and this challenge of connecting citizen science data sets to decision making. Um, Helen mentioned earlier about our freshwater citizen science tool, the mini SAS tool, which is, which is really great at estimating the quality of water in a river. But, um, you know, a lot of these assessments have been done, but how many of them have actually filtered their way up to the decision making level? I'm really not sure. I think um but 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 i know that you know the kinds of data sets that some citizen science uh, efforts are, are providing are, are highly valuable for decision making how have um how have you guys fed your citizen science data into decision making and have you been able to sort of track the impact that the data sets have had at that sort of level or yeah if you could speak to that a bit i'd be quite interested yeah so, so I, I, I think um, that, that rolling the data up the hill to, um, 
to policy to actually decision making is an incredibly difficult uh, process and um, and, I, and I, I think before our um, JRS project was was transferred from UCT to Freshwater Research Center, I don't think we were making any real headway there. So I, th I think I think you guys have got the uh, got the best solution that we've come up with, and that's the um, the FB, FBIS, um this project and. Uh, and I think you've just done amazingly well with that in terms of actually you know, getting the data into the uh, into the decision system. So, um, so um, uh, that was one thing I was hoping Ryan would also say is that one of the places where you actually get access to the um, to the to the Dragonfly Atlas is actually through um, Ephibus. And uh, so, so when you and you choose and you know, choose a dragonfly. One of the options that you have is actually is to link to the uh, to the atlas, and I think that's um, that's going to I think help enormously is actually to get the the information at least into the eyes of the <laughs> decision maker. I'm talking about eyes too much this morning. I don't know whether I I, I I don't know whether you were setting me up for that question, Jeremy, or whether. <laughs> But I, 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 I think what you guys are doing with FBIS is simply amazing. And I really wish you all the success with like, actually yeah. taking it further. Thanks, thanks Lesia. Yeah, no, I wasn't setting, setting you up, but uh, I can see how it looks like that way. <laughs> but thanks for the, for, for, the, for the supportive words. And yeah, that is the focus of, uh, of the, of the follow-on project is to try and yeah. take mm. these kinds of data sets closer to the top of it, that hill. Yeah. Um, mm. And it, I'm sure it's not going to be a smooth ride, um, but yeah, thanks so much. That that answers my question. Thank you. Great, thanks. I just wanted to make a comment in relation to that, uh, Les and Ryan. It might be quite a nice option to include a link from the Atlas pages back to FBIS, you know, where you actually have a to the specific yeah. taxon query. So, for example, each of your species, because I think FBIS just provides you yep. know the, the data over time yep. and a little bit of extra graphics um but create that synergy between you know going yep. back from the one to the other just made a note to to mention yep. mm -hmm. but i think um, i'm currently busy to... adding links to all pages sorry ryan sorry i'm currently busy adding links to all the pages so i will i will add all those on perfect um, that would be great I think the more that we can create these links and synergies between projects, the you know, it, I mean, you can't create a one-stop shop, but creating links, you allow a person to enter at any point and then yeah. explore a whole lot of interrelated uh, yeah. resources, which I think is extremely valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Liz, I mean, you know, the next phase of our FBIS is also going to be mobilizing the frog map data. So just for, you know, everyone, in the room, the next sort of aspect, which will probably kick off in June, um, is to get the, in the same way we've mobilized the Odonata map data is to mobilize the frog map data through the same dashboards, et cetera, that's currently in FBIS. And obviously we'll be chatting to you around that. Um, yeah, so, so, so potentially um, we, we can actually do a, a frog atlas on a very similar basis to what we've done this dragonfly atlas mm. and i think i think ryan knows quite a lot about frogs don't you <laughs> yeah fair, a fair <laughs> amount <laughs> it's one of my interest groups of interest for me so yeah mm. i definitely now, think that ryan 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 is is um, is is an excessively modest man he's a is an expert with all sorts of all sorts of uh, things. It's really quite 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 remarkable. <laughs> well, it's glad that you're part of the group. Then it's awesome. <laughs> I think um, what you've done with the atlas, uh, you know, the atlas pages is is fantastic resource. I really do think it is, and and we're feeling very inspired to do it for fish and you know even some of the aquatic inverts because chatting I'm involved in that in an invertebrate traits project as well and we are way behind what you've done in Europe Astrid but um, 
you know, we're really at the early stages, but to have a link as at, at a taxon level, you know, where the information exists, like on habitat and, you know, whichever, whatever information is available at a species level would be so useful. Um, and, and using using it as a as FBIS as a sort of the link point, which is also something we're hopefully striving towards. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question in the chat from Laban. I'm just saying, do you encourage the citizen science to, to catch the animals? I think especially the ones that are not easy to see um, and then they can be preser preserved or processed um, for identification. I don't think the citizen science is really about catching, it's photographing, that's your method of, of visual observation. Visual observation and then photographic record, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, um, you don't need permits to take the photographs, but as soon as you start handling the animals, then you start to need, uh, need permits. Okay. So, uh, so that's, that I think is a, is a consideration. Chorus, just also a comment from me. I, I really, really, really enjoyed your presentation um, and the, you know, the, the framing it in terms of how citizen scientists grow and how it changes their perception in terms of the connection between, you know, with nature and your analogy with, you know, the, the syringe and pandemic, etc. I think is it's very apt in today's you know world and I just yeah very I'm I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, keen interest to view all three presentations on on the channel because it's a lot of um, extremely great visuals and great information that you've shared with us today. Great. Thank you. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the, the same lines I was thinking. Once this is up on YouTube, I will uh, recommend the, the, especially the um, presentation of Caris to my colleagues because it was really kind of a mind-changing yes. presentation to not only see citizen scientists as data providers. Exactly. Really, really true. Thanks again, Caris. Thank you. Um, Good, we've got a few more minutes. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, no? Okay, I think then we'll, we'll leave it at that. But again, thank you so much, Liz, Corus, and Ryan for giving us your time um, and sharing with us such yeah, extremely valuable insight and presentations and uh, I, for one, have learned quite a bit, and I'm excited to share it further beyond the, the group that's actually been here physically. And I think there's going to be, as Astra said, a lot of interest uh, in all three aspects. I did share a link to the virtual museum, um, just for anyone out of South Africa who doesn't know anyone, just um, in the chat, you know, go and explore it. Obviously, you've got to sign up, but I think it gives you a sense of, you know, the, the 18 groups, taxon groups that are available and what a great resource this is. And yeah, I mean, Les, you've done such a great job in growing the, the community of citizen scientists. I know way beyond the borders of South Africa. And uh, you might want to also just mention, give your a mention, a shout out to your weekly seminar sessions, because I think that's also something that maybe people in the group here might be very interested in. Yeah, so um, so we, we have what we call citizen scientist hours. Um, they, they, they swap between evenings, usually Monday, oh, sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evenings are the evenings we usually hold them on. Um, next Wednesday, we have um, Kate Williams from the Cape Leopard Trust talking about the leopards in the mountains of the Western Cape. And we have uh, Perpetra Akiti, University, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's University in, in uh, Uganda talking about uh, butterflies in Uganda, Ugandan forests. And, um, and there's a YouTube channel uh, with about um, 100 videos. Um, Helen's got a 
presentation in there. Ryan has got a couple of presentations. You can you can you can listen to a different version of Chorus's presentation there as um, as well. Um, so 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 when when it it goes out onto the um, to the YouTube link, I'm I'm very happy for my email address to be there and uh, just field what what comes along as as queries and um, and you can potentially put the uh, the link to the citizen scientist hours through the YouTube channel as well. It's a friendly pet. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> she, she likes to sit behind my computer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 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 so long as it doesn't attack the mouse. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Okie dokes. Thank you so much, everybody, once again. Um, sure. No, I don't want to go and do any more work now. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a thanks. great session. So thanks, thanks again, and um, we'll be yeah. we'll be back in two weeks um, for another session. I'll fill you in through the week, and Jeremy will thanks. obviously send yeah. out everything. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank Appreciate you. the opportunity. Right. Bye thanks bye. so much. Thank bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Hey, that was awesome, you. Helen. That was really nice. Such fantastic presentations. Um, yeah, and such a